And we are live. Hello, everyone. Sorry about the wait. Uh, my name is Dmitry Kornyukov. Uh, I'm your host. Uh, join me tonight, my incredible co-host, Elena Tereshenko. Hi, Elena. Hello, everyone. And our guest, uh, an English Greek translator, Panas Humbavlis. Hello, Panas. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Very nice uh, talking to you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we had some uh, issues with internet connection, so we had to disable uh, the video stream of Panos, but he can hear us. So this is gonna how it's gonna look like. Uh, you're gonna see me and Yelena, and Panos is gonna be just with audio. I hope it's okay with you guys. Uh, before uh, we jump to our conversation, I would like to uh, remind all of our awesome viewers that uh, the second season of Translators on Air was sponsored by uh, our friends at SmartCut. Uh, SmartCut uh, develops translation technology and offers it to translators absolutely for free. If you want to help us out, uh, if you want to check it out, uh, uh, there is a green button below this video. Go to their website, check out what they have to offer. Or if you're watching this in the recording, uh, uh, you can click on the first link in the description. Uh, okay, uh, Panas, uh, how's it going? <laughs> It's going good. It's been raining all day here. Uh, it was a hectic day. I have a lot of work, but it's nice. I was really excited about this interview. I would like to apologize to everyone for not seeing me. Uh, we had some <laughs> issues. So yeah, pardon me. It's okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes things like this happen, especially when you're streaming live yeah. video. So no worries. Sure. At least we can hear you. That's, that's, and that's we can something. Hear you well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank God. Thank God for that. Yeah. So uh, the topic of our conversation is uh, starting out as a freelance translator, and Panas uh, would like to share some some of his experience of starting out in his business. Uh, and I guess so we can jump to our first question. Panas, what was the first thing uh, you did after you graduated from your university to kick off your career? Well. Yes. Well, I won't say parting with my French, which, uh, which <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah. I will say that uh, it was a time that I had to sit down, uh, pick a paper and a pen, and try to create a CV. What I would like to include, what I would like to say, what I would like to mention, and then um, try to find agencies and clients. So the very first step is to create a CV and a cover letter, of course. Did you have any preferences as to what clients you wanted to work with? Did you know straight ahead that you want to work with agencies or with direct clients? How did you make your decisions in that respect? Yeah, well, we had um, talked about it before we graduated from our college. So I knew uh, in kind of way what I would like to approach first, uh, direct clients or agencies. I chose agencies because with zero experience, it's more difficult to approach direct clients and have them trust you, that you yeah. do a decent job, that you're a good translator. So I approach translation agencies, first in Greece and then in some countries abroad. Uh, did you ever consider starting out uh, in an in office position, maybe looking for a, a translator position in some company and not in freelance? Yes, of course. I think it would be easier, you know, as an in-house uh, before, because when you don't have uh, uh, experience, it would be nice to see how it is from the inside in, the, in an agency. That's why I went in a translation agency in the city that I, that I lived and I live and asked to work part-time as a freelance translator, as an in-house, sorry, as an in-house translator. How did it go? Because, <laughs> yes, because when you're a freelancer, uh, you have more responsibilities. Sure. Right? So you have to be sure that you are able to do the job, to do all that it takes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and uh, 
you mentioned that the very first thing that you started uh, uh, doing after you graduate is working on your CV and on your cover letter. Uh, can you tell me what was the most difficult thing about creating a good CV? Well, I think it's difficult because when you're not experienced, you don't know what to write. <laughs> I mean, it's very short. So mm -hmm. you have to make it presentable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you cannot lie. It's forbidden to lie, to write something that is not true. So you have to be creative and try to hide that out, not highlight it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a difficult task. I mean, even some experienced uh, translators and people in general uh, find it difficult to create a good CV, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to include what's necessary. Uh, so I knew it was going to be short, but I was honest and that's what mattered. Did you use any resources about writing CVs written by translators or probably by some other uh, professionals? Yes, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. What kind of, of course. The first thing I did, yes, the first thing I did was, of course, Google. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how to yeah yeah uh, how to create a good CV uh, what to include um, if it's gonna be short a little longer how many pages uh, should for example I put a photo of my face should I not um, should I write about activities that I do and all that stuff because it varies from country to country mm -hmm. and from yeah. what you're going to use your CV for, right? Uh, it's different when you're applying to work as a translator, right? And it's different when you apply to work for another job that you don't have uh, a diploma or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, I read some articles uh, from some experienced translators, freelancers, that had some to do and what not to do. And then I emailed a very highly experienced translator mm -hmm. and I sent her my CV and told her if she thought it was good enough, right? Mm -hmm. If it was presentable. And of course, uh, to make sure that I didn't have any grammar or syntax error, which is very important. Was it, was it a translator working in your language pairs or was it someone working within, with uh, well, some other languages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I approached someone with the same language pairs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, because I also sent a cover letter. Mm -hmm. And it's also a tricky part because you don't want to write a lot of stuff. Uh, you want to write what's important. Uh, you want to make it nice, easy, uh, and not boring, of course. Mm -hmm. And that what can about, be a little challenging. What about the length of the cover letter? Do you prefer to go in something short and sweet, or do you describe all your past experience and something like that? Well, I believe it's good if you keep it short. Because if I assume that uh, we send this to an agency, a big one, uh, that receives hundreds of emails uh, from all around the world, from all these freelancers, uh, of course, okay, we all can assume that nobody's going to read uh, a very long CV, a very long cover letter. Uh, but once the agency approaches you, then you can fully mention uh, your experiences, mm -hmm. the fields that you're working for, et cetera, et cetera. Keep it short, and if they're interested, reply. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so you're working mostly with agencies, is that correct? Or do you also have uh, the direct clients, or at least try to approach direct clients? Mostly agencies, yes, you assume right. I'm still new. I've mm -hmm. only been working for two years, both as an in-house and freelance translator. Um, of course, I want to approach direct clients, but it's a slow process. Mm -hmm. 
All right, it comes with experience, I think. Mm -hmm. If I may return, but you do have to approach them. Yes. If I may return to, to yeah to this uh, to the question about CV, uh, how uh, you you mentioned that you are now also work with agencies uh, located not uh, in Greece but in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how your CV for those agencies uh, situated. Uh, not within Greece are different from the ones located in Greece. Are there a lot of differences? Do you tailor your CV, CVs for uh, different countries? How do you go about it? Yes, that's a good question. Well, I only have a CV in English, mm -hmm. right? Apart from a Greek one, of course. Yeah. Um, I don't work with uh, other languages at this moment. Mm -hmm. So some people that have two working languages, for example, could have uh, two or three CVs. Uh, but it's mostly the same. It's mm -hmm. mostly the same, yes. I follow the same um, uh, Principle. prototype of I follow the same steps, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Experience, um, projects, education, uh, seminars, uh, associations that I'm a member of mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So uh, uh, I have a question. Do you think uh, CV is helpful and, and cover letters are helpful when uh, marketing your services online or are they kind of outdated? I ask because uh, I haven't used my CV in quite some time now. Uh, my my website uh, kind of replaced me a CV. So if I ever try to approach a client, uh, I normally just share my website and that has all the information about me. Uh, do you think CV is uh, here to stay or maybe uh, there are better ways to market your services like website, for example? Well, yes, uh, websites are the greatest, are a very nice way to promote yourself, to market yourself. But I think it would take time to create one. Mm -hmm. um, once you're experienced, of course, uh, it's easier. Sometimes you don't even have to send a CV. Sometimes agencies find you because uh, you're recommended by a very uh, respectful peer of yours, a colleague, uh, clients. So it's easier. I do believe that having a CV is essential when you start out as a freelancer. It's very important. Uh, you should have one. It illustrates and demonstrates your education uh, and your experience, whatever there is. But uh, you should also try to market yourself, definitely. Uh, some people start by having a blog right, and write. Which I think is very important, yeah. Can I also answer this question? Because uh, yes, <laughs> my experience... My experience, I actually, yes, yes, yes. I actually agree with everything that Panas has said, and I think that CV has its place. I think you're mostly, when you approach a client, you mostly approach direct clients, right? So uh, in my experience, when I approach direct clients, I don't send my CV. I send uh, something else. I send an email, I send some kind of offer. I don't send my CV, but when I approach agencies, uh, I do send them CVs because, firstly, that's their requirement. Uh, secondly, mm -hmm. CV is a way to, for me personally, it's a way to to show my general expertise. So I don't uh, apply uh, to work on uh, particular projects, for example, on uh, translators, care hand websites like that. Um, I sometimes just send CVs to agencies that have been recommended by colleagues or that I just like for some reason and uh, in that case it works well uh, on the other hand several agencies have approached me through my website I'm, I also had a chance to work with some of them with some of them so a website is a great tool not only to attract direct clients but uh, agencies as well if you want to work with them so I, I think both tools work and have their place yeah, definitely. And you know what? Uh, when you have a website, it's a 24-7 advertisement. It's always yeah. there. Everyone can have access. It's great, right? Mm -hmm. It saves a lot of, of your time. Uh, but some people, uh, some translators, 
I've noticed that they do include their CV on their website. It says someone download my CV or check my mm -hmm. CV and stuff, which is also mm -hmm. nice. Which is also nice, yes. Do you have a, a website? Panos? Not yet. No, mm -hmm. not yet. Do you use <laughs> Still anything? To figure a, that out. Do, you, <laughs> do you use anything as a replacement for for your website? Probably a LinkedIn profile or something like that. Yes, social media, another mm -hmm. factor when you start out. Uh, I do love and I'm a huge fan of the Open Meet, right? It's a mm -hmm. great place. Hey. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, really. <laughs> uh, it's an awesome place because uh, you get to read all these amazing stories, people exchanging their opinions, their views. Um, and you can see that what you're going to do later in life, what you've dreamed of all your life is there, it's out there, you know, people are doing it, people are being successful. Um, and it's a great experience. It's a great place uh, to meet people, um, to read stories, um, to express your opinion, right? So totally. yeah, there are platforms, translated platforms that are very helpful. And you can make a beautiful profile there. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, a beautiful. Yeah. A professional looking and one. Meet some wonderful... <laughs> <laughs> true, true. And meet some wonderful people from all around the world. Yeah, that's also nice. What about other social media like Twitter or Facebook? Do you use them? Yes, yes, I do use them sometimes while I'm working. So it's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes away part of my productivity, yes. <laughs> I try to stay away. Um, but, I mean, who doesn't? Not only to promote yourself, but, of course, we all have a Facebook account. I mean, we talk with family and friends. But since you use them, why not use them to promote yourself and market yourself, right? You can have a professional Twitter account, for example. The and how do you talk how, about how, and share. How do you promote yourself? About your profession, yeah. Well, a great way is to write articles mm -hmm. or share uh, things that think you might in, that might interest other people, other colleagues, uh, not only translators, but freelancers in general, mm -hmm. right? Because there are some things in common when you're a freelance um, translator, doctor, lawyer, we all need uh, to market ourselves. We all need to keep up with technology. We all need to find direct, direct clients. It's crucial that we do that. And how, uh, circling back to the topic of the conversation, we are talking about the people who are just starting out in this profession. How can they uh, use social media to promote their services? Because I guess uh, right. a lot of people who come to this profession, uh, they have no idea what, what's going on in the profession. When I, I remember when I just was starting out, I had no idea we have forums for translators. I had no idea there are Facebook groups, uh, Twitter accounts or something like that. Uh, so I guess a lot of people are new to this whole social media thing. Uh, I mean, in, in, in the context of using it professionally. So uh, what advice can you give to people who are just uh, starting out in this profession and would like to use social media and leverage to to attract clients? Okay, I'm going to say that it's imperative that you have at least one profile somewhere mm -hmm. in a translator's mm -hmm. platform. Uh, a lot of agencies, as a matter of fact, do want to mention uh, your profile your username, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's pros, uh, which is for uh, translators and interpreters, and you can uh, find agencies and clients, right? Uh, there's the open mic that we mentioned before, uh, but it's not strictly professional in the meaning that you find clients or agencies. Uh, and LinkedIn, right? It's mm -hmm. one of the most... Uh, famous social media at the moment and for professional use only. Um, mm -hmm. So you should 
choose a platform that you like, that you do have the time to um, re log into often and write and share and comment and read. And you should actually try at least uh, once or two or three times a week uh, use them, use your social media. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, your answer made me think of a BP translation conference that I attended back in April and the social media was a very hot topic there and uh, basically Still people... <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think it's <laughs> yeah. going to be for the next couple of years at least. And uh, some, yeah, some translators were saying that you don't have to use any social media because uh, that's not somewhere, that's not a place to find clients and it's just, you, you don't need this. And some translators said that social media is a great way to find clients. And the tendency was that the more experienced and established translators were against social media and I think it was partly because of the areas of specialization where they were working, because they were working uh, either in patent translation or in uh, or in legal translation or translating for some big companies. And probably their clients are not on social media and probably they can't find them there and they don't need it because they have a reputation and clients, they are at that point in their career where the clients come to them and they don't basically need to market themselves that much anymore because they have established a reputation for themselves but i agree with what you say uh, with regards to translators who are just starting out because i have also seen um, agencies who were asking you to provide your twitter handle or a link to your facebook page or linkedin page so Can you hear that? I'm sorry. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. I agree yes. with that. Um, having a social media presence for uh, someone who is just starting out as a freelance translator is probably a must. So I more agree with that. Yeah, I totally uh, well, agree uh, with you. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would like to add that I agree that uh, it all depends on the area of your specialization. Uh, that's why mm -hmm. I guess it's very important for those who are just starting out to establish oh. early uh, where they really want to work. Because when I was just studying at my uh, university, uh, we had to translate everything. Uh, we, we, we were just like medical texts, legal texts, financial texts, uh, literature, pretty much everything. So when I was I just graduated, I had no idea that you actually need to specialize or you actually need to choose a, a narrow niche so you could work in it and find client, clients more easily. So it's at all, uh, I had to work in a variety of different fields during the past few years before I finally figured out that I, I want to work in video game localization. So I guess uh, if you're talking for about uh, translators who are just starting out, I think it's, it's important to uh note uh to say that uh, you need to establish your uh, field of expertise early on mm -hmm. yes uh, well uh, about social media i would like to add that it's not only to promote yourself but it can come handy in a lot of various and different reasons for example there are certain facebook groups that i'm a member of and when I have a question, for example, I can put it there and so many great translators from around the world can answer and give me an insight, their opinion, their thoughts, or to help me with a translation, with a term, for example, mm -hmm. right? You can also ask help, which is very, very crucial yes. and important for us, right? Uh, and stories and articles and learn about so many great things. For example, I remember that uh, on social media, I read about localization, for example. And what is localization, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't um, say that it's not helpful or it is time consuming. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep up with technology and social media. 
it has a great power. It does. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It does. Uh, Panis, so uh, let's talk about your experience again. Uh, can you share what uh, worked best for you when you were just starting out? Uh, regarding what factor? Well, in general, what uh, what strategies that you use that work well? Uh, what didn't work out as well as you would hope would work out? Something like that. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, one thing that was a bummer was that you think that once you send your CVs, your CV to a hundred of agencies, they gonna reply. You know, they're gonna send an email back and say, "Yeah, great, we want to work with you." Mm -hmm. No, not that easy, right? <laughs> you have to be patient, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, that can be a little frustrating. Uh, you can be a little disappointed, uh, but you should not give up, right? It takes time. It really does take time, uh, which is good, because you have more time to sort out what you would like to translate. Mm -hmm right the fields of expertise um so that was a little disappointing but in the meantime i tried to find a highly experienced and skilled uh colleague that could be my mentor mm. that can help me out and point out uh, certain things and aspect that uh, i didn't know that i wasn't aware of um so i would say that Having a mentor is uh, important, yes. It's a very nice thing. Because they can provide with um, uh, recommendation letters, with references, they can recommend you, they can outsource work, right? So mm -hmm. find someone that you're feeling comfortable with, uh, that you share the same vision maybe, uh, same goals, uh, that he or she um, has done something that you're a fan of, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that you envy in a good way, right? So, and ask them about their opinion, uh, about what you can do. Uh, I must say that a lot of people were extremely helpful uh, when I started asking them questions and sending them emails. Uh, a lot of uh, Greek translators um, were very eager to say their opinion. I mostly yeah. reached out to people with my, um, with the same language pair mm -hmm. as mine, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's um, much or important. Mm -hmm. As long as some experience. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to reach out to people who are experienced, who uh, has experience in, in the same, especially in the same field of uh, uh, work that you would like to work in. Uh, of course, not everyone's going to uh, be as helpful, but uh, in general, uh, I think a lot of people are actually willing to help. And uh, I, of course, uh, all of the translators are busy people, so uh, I guess you have to be very uh, respectful and not too pushy, I guess. Uh, because, yes, you know, sometimes people, yes, yes. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes can people take a lot of your time <laughs> and ask, asking a hundred of questions all at once and looking for uh, uh, quick solutions. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, if you're just starting out, uh, you, sh you should definitely try reaching out to some uh, people who are, in your opinion, are experienced and can help you uh, and can give you answers to your questions. But uh, I would recommend just uh, to keep it short. <laughs> I'm talking from my experience because uh, I also had to reach out to people and I occasionally have people who are reaching out to me mm -hmm. uh, for, for my help or advice. Uh, and I know that it's, it's very difficult to uh find time and it's very uh soul crushing uh then a, pe a person who is uh, uh uh your role model or something hasn't replied to your email <laughs> because it, ha it happened so it happened with, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, ha it happened with me a couple of days ago uh 
a person that reached out to me asking for my advice and I was uh, in the middle of my travels to Russia. So uh, I, I forgot to answer the email. It was uh, on the bottom of my uh, mailbox. I mean, my mailbox is always full with uh, emails <laughs> from clients, colleagues, from uh, mentions with, from the open mic, social media. So it's, it's really hard to lose track of things. But uh, I'm glad she followed up. Uh, I think she followed up or I followed up. But anyway, it took me about a week or so to get back to that person. So uh, if you're reaching out to someone uh, who is who might be very busy, I think it's a good idea to follow up <laughs> because sometimes people just can they can miss uh, an email or put it to uh, uh, answer it. They decide they, they want to answer it later and then they forget. They, they don't really mean to be rude. They just uh, life gets in the way and work gets in the way and when you're st just starting out, uh, you have to understand that uh, most of the time you are just by yourself and you, you only have to rely on yourself. And uh, But there are a lot of good people who will help you. For sure. Yes. And of course, you always have to be polite. I mean, of course. And you always yes. have to respect other people's time, right? And schedule. And we all know that it's a hectic profession and you can easily... I lose track of emails, phone calls, messages, etc. Um, but instead of, I don't know, if you have that many questions, you can ask to meet Foucault, for, for example, right? Instead of exchange all these emails, you can meet up for coffee or for lunch uh, and ask the questions there, right? It's hey, more polite. It's a good uh, idea to schedule an someone who's who's uh, living not far from you. I think it's even better. Yes, because you know it's a common secret because we all want to get out of our office <laughs> as often as we can, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we all know that. So yeah, it's a great way. I also like what you said but, about yeah. In general, that... people will be <coughs> go on. Yeah, sorry. Go, yeah, go on. Go. <laughs> I like. Oh, okay, I, I would like to say that. <laughs> okay, we're in sync today. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. please, Elena, tell yeah. me. I like what you said about not feeling. Uh, well, you didn't use that word exactly. Depressed, not feeling uh, disheartened when you don't get uh, replies. Yes, yeah, disappointed when you don't get replies to your emails, uh, or when you send CVs to agencies. So. I think I think it's very important, and uh, the thing that Dmitri said about following up is important as well. And I also wanted mm -hmm. to remark that uh, this whole mentoring thing is becoming uh, popular among translators, I guess, because we are going we are actually going to talk about mentoring for translators next week with our next <laughs> guest. But there's one thing I want to ask oh, you. Nice. Uh, and it's, yes. do you think, okay. do you have, do you personally have, what's your experience? Do you personally have uh, one mentor or do you think that you can actually be mentored by several people without them even knowing about it? Because mentoring, as far as I understand it, it's basically learning from a more experienced person and you can learn from a lot of people in the industry and in our profession and outside our profession. And uh, in some way, they're all your mentors. What's your experience? Do you have one mentor who you generally go to with your problems? Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because saying that I have a mentor is very vague. Um, mm -hmm. I do have my business partner. Um, she owns the, the translation agency that I work for, mm -hmm. right? That I work in house for. Um, she's a great translator, she's highly experienced, uh, she's a great artist. Uh, she's been working as a translator for so many years. Uh, she is a native in both uh, English and Greek. So it was, uh, it is a perfect opportunity for me because I get to use my English, right? Uh, to avoid mistakes that I make. Uh, she's always there. She's always proofreading my files, my translations, um, and that. And she's my main mentor, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I hope I can be as great one day as she is. Mm -hmm. uh, so big shout out to Maria Frederica Gregory, uh, an amazing translator and a human being. Uh, she's a great friend. 
about throughout these two years of, I would say that uh, a couple of other people have helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, Evdoxia Renta and her husband Terry, uh, who now live in the United Kingdom, both very experienced. Uh, they've been working like for 20 years uh, in the same language pair that I, I do use. Uh, and they're always very uh, helpful. They're always there for me uh, to answer questions, to tell me what I should avoid, uh, to learn from my mistakes, um, I don't know, to proofread a file, um, to recommend me to clients or for books that they think I'm suitable for. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can say that I have like two or three but not on a daily basis. On a daily basis, I only have Maria, mm -hmm. the person who worked together. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, I guess we can take a couple of questions, right? We have a, quite a few questions uh, in the really? comment box oh, below. Nice. Yeah, a, yes. a lot of excellent questions. And people ask us uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, Elena, uh, would you mind uh, reading out some of the questions? Sure. Uh, let's start with the uh, with, uh, most upvoted questions. Uh, the one, uh, the first question is from Paige. She asks, how do you approach direct clients? Do you work with direct clients now? Do you have any way of approaching them? Something that works for you? Mm -hmm. Well, hi Paige. Uh, that's a really nice question. Yes. Well, it's easy for me in a way because uh, we have an office. We don't work from home, right? Mm -hmm. So when you do have an office somewhere, uh, it's in it's downtown uh, on a main street. Uh, it's a constant advertisement, so people come and ask sometimes, "What exactly do you do? Uh, what is translation? Can I translate this? Can I translate that?" So it's very easy to find direct clients. Uh, well, if I work from home, it would be a little more difficult. But, for example, you can have a business card, right? It's highly recommended that you always have, that you always carry a business card. Because uh, it has happened several times to me. Uh, let's, just say, let's just say we hang out with some friends and some people come over and they ask what your profession is, what do you do for a living? And you say, I'm a translator for the specific language pair. And they say, oh, I might need you. Can you give me your card, your phone number, your email, right? So actually from going out, from going to seminars, conferences, uh, friends, family, that's when you start out. You call people and you say, well, I graduated. I have my um, diploma, I have my degree. I do translate from these languages into these ones. And if you need me, give me a call. I provide the specific services that you mentioned on your card, on your CV or your blog or somewhere. And you try to reach out to as many people as possible. Yeah. I think uh, more people should actually have an office somewhere. Yeah. The thing is, not not everyone can afford place, having an office. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, especially when you start <laughs> out. Yeah, it's that depends on. Yeah, it depends on the country you live, on the city. Uh, but if, for example, you live with your parents and you can't afford a small place, right, uh, with a small rent, uh, it would be nice. Another problem is that your clients might be situated in quite another country because I personally don't work from yes. clients who are based in Russia. I work with agencies and direct clients who work, uh, who are based in English speaking countries. And I'm also looking at the next question Paige asked. Uh, she says that she's interested in translating books. Um, so we actually have a whole episode in the had an, a whole episode in the first season of uh, it was called blabbing translators then and we'll put the link in the show notes for your page mm -hmm. uh, but i think a good way to approach direct clients and uh, probably authors is to find 
um, a product, in your case, probably a book or uh, an app or something like that, that you really like, uh, find out who find out who uh, developed it or who, who has written it. I'm now talking about uh, the books by self-published authors, obviously. Uh, and then just try to send an email to that person and or probably approach them on social media and just try to start the conversation going. Because um, approaching direct clients is mainly about building a relationship with them. And uh, because it's, it would be nice if you could just uh, write them, I want to translate your book, I want to translate your app, and they would agree, but that basically never works. You have to first uh, build, a, build a relationship and show, educate them and show them the value that you can provide with your services. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite complicated. And I, I think we should probably make it a subject to one of our next episodes, right, Dmitry? Uh, you mean uh, finding direct clients or finding yeah, direct approaching, clients? Approaching direct clients. Approaching yeah, direct approaching clients. Direct. I think, I think uh, we talked, uh, Rafa told quite a lot about approaching direct clients yeah. uh, in book she, translation, she, and we should put the show notes. We would put the link in the show notes. Yeah, yes, yes, Paige. Uh, uh, we, have, uh, we had an episode uh, uh, with Rafa Lambordina. Uh, she's, I think, quite popular. Uh, in certain circles, especially in the literature translation, and, and she had shared a ton of advice on approaching yes. clients, especially in the fields of literature and working with self-published offers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to send you a link. After, oh, and Paige, uh, and Paige is saying that uh, she has a local author in mind. That's just awesome. When you have a local author whom you can help, I think it's just great. Let us know how it goes. Yeah. Uh, just like Elena said, it's all about building a relationship. But sales do not happen on the first touch point. Uh, the, the first thing you need to know, you just need to establish a connection. Uh, you need to establish uh, a relationship, and then you just slowly work uh, your way into it, and then uh, figure out how to sell your services. Uh, even if you do not sell anything, uh, even if you just goes nowhere it's still a good experience to actually try and do something different rather than sending uh, dozens of emails every day to translation agencies because mm -hmm. all of us want to work with uh, direct clients of course uh and many of us actually do work with direct clients and uh, it's it's not really rocket science i would say it's uh, it's not very really that that difficult once you put your mind to it it's it just all about uh, patience and persistence and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work uh, for you personally because i think there are a ton of advice on finding direct clients on the internet uh, you, you can just google it and find a ton of articles about finding clients uh, uh, but the best way is to try and do it yourself. Do a ton of mistakes <laughs> because uh, it, it, you're going to do a ton of mistakes. I, I did a ton of mistakes. I'm still doing a ton of mistakes probably <laughs> when I'm approaching clients, but I'm still at least I'm uh, uh, doing something. It's much better to do something than uh, just sit and wait for the perfect opportunity to land in your inbox, which never going to happen. <laughs> yes. Well, can I add something? Uh, well, yeah. Elena sure. said something very, very important, and I think we should point that out. Uh, she said that you have to educate your clients, and that's just awesome because so many people out there do not know what translators do, mm. right? I mean, we all have faced at least one person that says, okay, right, great, you're a translator, that's so amazing, but what exactly do you do? So you have to educate them, tell them what services you provide and what is the game, what they're going to get out of it. They mm -hmm. have, you have to sell your services. You are a business of your own. So you should sell your services, sell yourself in a way that if he or she choose you, uh, they're going to get something, for example. Uh, their app, the translated app, is going to be approachable to more people. 
in other countries, right? Which means profit for them. Yes. You should always take the time and tell them uh, what you do, what they're going to gain out of it, uh, what services you provide. And with direct clients, it might take some time to, uh, to have someone uh, trust you and come, uh, come again and have a regular basis with them. But you should always advertise yourself. Like Dimitri say, you rely on yourself and you advertise it in any way possible. And all the time, it never stops. So people won't even mention that they're doing translations. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, we, we still have a couple of questions. Uh, we do. Uh, if, you do, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to read uh, sure. the next questions from uh, uh, Suzanne uh, Ritwild. Uh, in what order should you get ready as a starting translator? I'm now in my final year for my bachelor in translating English Dutch. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, the question was, uh, in what order should you get ready as a starting translator? I am now in my final year of my bachelor in translating English Dutch. Okay. Uh, well, by the time you graduate, you have to know what fields you like the most, you like to translate the most. I think it's very important um, to figure out uh, what makes you happy when you translate it, what doesn't take that much of a time, uh, and invest in it. Invest on books, on reading, on seminars, on buying a uh, technical, for example, dictionary. You have to know what you're after, what you're aiming for, right? Um, of course, it's important to create a CV, and it's also very important uh, to use catalogs, to know at least to use one catalog for charges, for example, because in some universities or colleges, they do not offer uh, some programs uh, about teaching how to use a catalog, but you can find a seminar and attend that and learn how to use one. Most agencies will ask you to provide the cat tool you use. Mm -hmm. That's true. You can't be a translator or a new, uh, new to this field and don't know how to use a cat tool. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if, if you're still a student, uh, uh, you said, uh, Suzanne, it's your last year. Uh, I'm going to tell you that you're already late to get, get started because you you have to get started as as, as early as possible. Yes. Uh, it, it, it was my experience as well. Uh, when I was when I just graduated, I had no idea what I'm going to do. I had no idea how how to find a job. I had no idea uh, where to go. I I didn't have any idea how how the whole this whole translation process work. Am I, am I going to go to the office and I'm going to sit at my computer at home? What I'm going to do? Uh, and they never they never taught us this uh, at my university back then. I don't know if, if, any, if anything has changed now, but uh, from what I know, uh, it hasn't. a lot of uh, educational facilities, they, they don't prepare you for a work, uh, for work. So you have to start early and you have to start it on your own. Uh, so even though you're still in university and you probably have a ton of assignments and to a ton of uh, exams to take and a ton of courses, uh, you, you better figure out how to promote your services uh, early on. You better figure out how to build a good CV. Uh, and the first steps that you, you, you should take, and you, you just... Uh, you should start doing something about your future career because this is your future. Uh, it all depends on you. Uh, if you don't do anything about it and hope that everything just going to work out on itself, it, it's not going to work out on itself. Or you, you will probably waste a ton of time just figuring everything out. So start as soon, as, as early as, as possible. And you, you'll do just fine. It, of course, it's a, it's a time consuming process, but uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's worth trying and do it uh, while you're still in school because at least uh, uh, you can learn from others and you, you, you are prepared when you actually graduated. 
a couple of things I want to add here uh, is, well, first of all, I agree with everything what the guys said, and especially with what Dmitry said about starting out now, because, um, well, you can uh, find some time in your day and start translating some things, probably start with something that you like, uh, just to just to have some practice. You probably have a lot of practice at the university, <laughs> but uh, just to have a go at something, at some real life things, at something that you probably like, or uh, volunteering as a translator uh, for some uh, non-profit organizations, or probably translating subtitles because subtitling is a hot subject right now, and you can translate subtitles for TED or Kusoro and uh, things like that, so that you can actually have something to show when you go out there and try to find some work, you can actually show something, some work that you have done. And uh, that experience will be invaluable. And another thing uh, that I wanted to say is that probably you can already start building some connections and building your network, because networking with your peers and Probably also with, if you already know in what area you want to work and what area you want to specialize, probably with some, with some uh, direct clients in that area of specialization is uh, actually great. And you, if you have that network, it will also be easier to find work after you graduate. Should I read the next question? Yeah. It yeah. was, I want to read uh, the question from Hagen, who asks, uh, uh, actually... Can I add something? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Real quick. First of all, I would like to point out that um, we're talking about our experiences, uh, how we started out from our point of view. Of course, the same doesn't apply to anyone, right? And it varies yeah. from country to country, language per university. Some universities, for example, do have uh, classes for cattles. Uh, we did example for subtitles, subtitles workshops, mm -hmm. right? And they do uh, provide subtitling services. So uh, some people may have a different opinion and different views on these all on these topics we're talking about. Uh, and it would also be nice for new translators to provide um, translation voluntarily. Like you said, TEDx, or for example, I do, pro, I do translate voluntarily some articles at Global Voices Greece. Mm -hmm. And it's a great experience. I get to choose the articles that I want from topics that I like. I do translate them and they get published. And you have, like Elena say, you have to, you do have something to show, some experience. Because some agencies, for example, ask sample of your work. And that's what our next question from Hagen is about. He's asking what are your oh. <laughs> samples? Does it make sense to display them, for example, on your website? What resources do you choose to use for work samples? That's a tricky topic, guys, right? Mm. Yeah, it does. Yes. I mean, you're more experienced than that. And a lot of dispute uh, has been going on all these years. For example, some agencies ask you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. For example, I cannot publicly say uh, about the subtitling that I'm doing and the company. Uh, some other companies say that um, you cannot use uh, the specific translation without consulting me first because it has personal data. I cannot put on my website uh, something that mentions names or money or it's legal or it's medical, right? You should be very careful. That's where uh, translations, uh, volunteering as a translator or, ha or having your personal passion project comes in. Because, for example, yeah. I have a ton of samples of my work because I've been translating uh, I, I've been uh, I have a weekly newsletter in Russian where I translate articles that I love and find inspiring and send them out to my Russian subscribers and if someone needs a sample of my work I can just pick any article that I want or part of that article and send it I won't have to translate anything new and spend time on that I just can take something that I already have
And I also think that uh, when yes. you translate things like subtitles for TED, I think TED, uh, they even uh, have the names of the translators working on their project somewhere in the description of the video and things like that. So yeah, it's published work. Yeah, I, I've never worked with TED, but I think that you're right. Yeah, they do mention the name of this translator. Global Voices Greece, uh, they do say, they do mention of the person that translated and from which language. Mm -hmm. And they even have your photo. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's nice. Instead of asking a direct client, for example, uh, would you mind using these two pages, for example, um, to another client or agency? As for displaying uh, the work samples on your website, I actually want to provide a link to because uh, that that other project, I Love Monday's project, actually has its own separate website. And I actually want to display a link on my business website, but I just can't get around to that. <laughs> so I, I personally think it's a good idea. Or, yeah probably a separate page with the portfolio or something like that. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, if you yes, ask because, me... Uh, sorry, Panas. Like, uh, sorry, like, uh, I mean, a lot of translators choose to mention uh, the companies or agencies they work for, or projects they've done, mm -hmm. if it's a, a very big and important project, for example. Mm -hmm. So why not mention or have a sample of your work? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. As long as you are not violating any kind of confidentiality, uh, you know, not in breach yes. of contract, uh, and you reached out to the client or the person who provided that text before publishing it and, and, and using it as a work example, uh, you're, you're good to go. Uh, I personally, I don't use work samples uh, for one simple reason. My clients, they don't speak Russian. So uh, mm. most of the client, most <laughs> most of my clients probably wouldn't understand uh, a thing I'm saying on my translation because mm. all my clients are from either Canada or United States or Europe and they don't speak Russian. Uh, so they they kind of they have to rely on me and my skill. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if I ever had uh, if I ever need to show uh, showcase my work. I can always say what kind of games I have localized to, to my clients, as long mm -hmm. as long as uh, I am allowed to do that. Because some sometimes the games I'm working on haven't been released yet officially, so of course I cannot uh, spill out any details or even say that uh, this new highly anticipated sequel is being developed, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. But as, as long yeah. as uh, the projects uh, that uh, I have done are actually completed and available. Uh, uh, on uh, Android or Steam or iTunes, so, uh, I can easily just point my clients to that direction in case they, they, they wanted to. Uh, yeah, this is a great example of, of, of showcasing your work. Uh, I guess it's very important to showcase your work uh, and, and have a portfolio of sorts, uh, but uh, it's not always uh, uh, a mandatory thing. Like I said, for example, most of my clients, uh, they choose to rely on my expertise and uh, they don't speak any Russian. Uh, but if I had clients who spoke Russian, I could easily uh, show them my work. And so uh, work examples are important, but not necessary. <laughs> it's all depending on the client. Shall we take another question from our yeah. audience yeah. from Margot? By the way, she asks I thank was... you guys for so many yeah. questions this time around uh, yeah. most of the time our, our audience is very shy and they just here to watch quietly but this time around you guys really uh had a ton of questions and we are we are happy to answer them uh, it's it's the most exciting part yes. of our show, you guys. Of our show you. yeah to, to having a lively conversation and uh talking about topics that's interesting to you first of all so yeah thank you so much for asking the questions Maybe we should do a follow-up, so, but no. this time I do have a video, right, guys? I know it's my fault, I mean, but next time I will, you will can see me too. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> 
So now for the question. I was wondering how difficult it was to break in the translation market after graduation. I'm still a student in translation and during my internship last year, I wasn't given any translations to do since I was not specialized in any particular topic. What's your take on that, Panas? Yes, well, uh, as we said before, it takes time. You should really be patient. I know I wasn't, I'm not a really patient guy, uh, but you don't really have a choice. Uh, you do your best, you reach out to as many people as possible, uh, but then you have to wait. But even if you're about to graduate, you can grab this opportunity and set out. Con uh, contact clients, uh, send your CV to agencies. Don't wait to graduate, for example, right? Uh, before you graduate, you can provide uh, volunteer translations um, and be patient. The someone actually will uh, call you back, will email you back, will assign you to a project. Yeah, it's and very difficult. while in college, yeah, it's very difficult. And let me just say that while in college, we all have uh, the chance to sort out what fields we like the most and which we're not. For example, I hate manuals. I don't like scientific texts. I really love them, right? I can. So uh, even if you don't have a lot of experience, you could mention on your CV the fields that you like the most, that you feel comfortable uh, translating, that you want to invest, right? Uh, instead of saying, I will do anything. And don't um, don't be shy to say no. Do not be afraid to refuse. If you're not, if you do think that you're not going to be able to deliver a good quality, it's better to refuse an assignment than say that I'm going to be, I'm going to do it, and then deliver a poor translation because this is your work. It reflects on your work, on what you do. Yes. And I know it's hard saying no when you first start out as a translator, when you want to translate so bad. It, it's not hard. It's quite, sometimes it's quite impossible because uh, all of us have uh, different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are just forced to take, um, to take any, anything that comes on our plate, especially when you're just starting out and you, you want to make a living out of it. Uh, I guess uh, my advice would be uh, before jumping into this whole freelance thing, uh, try searching for something in the office. I guess this is what I did uh, before going to, uh, into the freelance full time. Uh, I actually went to a translation agency in the city where I used to live and I got an in-house position for myself. Of course, so we all have uh, different backgrounds. Uh, I don't know where exactly you live. Maybe you don't have translation agencies out there. Uh, but it's worth trying to find an in-house job, uh, even if it's not closely related to translation. Uh, maybe it's, it's in marketing or something else. Uh, it doesn't matter. As long as you have income uh, and you can cover uh, your rent, uh, you can put food on your table, you're good. Uh, freelancing is not easy. It's, it's, it's very difficult. It's difficult for all of us, even for those people who has been here for decades uh, and many, many years. It's, it's not, it's not going to get any easier. It's not like uh, we have thousands of clients lining up uh, and just uh, wanted to buy a translation from us. It's, it's always uh, hard work every single day. So uh, starting out is very difficult, but keeping up is even more difficult. So uh, it, it builds character, this profession. And you just have to clutch your teeth and just soldier on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. It never stops. A good idea would be to intern somewhere, let's just say for a month or two months or over the summer before you graduate. But that will give you an idea from the inside of how being a full-time translator is. But as Mitri said, uh, and he's so very right, it never ends and it takes time to establish your business to have a certain workflow, uh, a certain income coming in without having to worry about rent or other expenses. 
you can expect to graduate and after two or three months have uh, clients, so many clients, a big project. It takes time. Yes, absolutely. So in response to Margot's question, be patient and uh, choose your specialization as soon as possible, probably yes. during your last year at the university. Okay, uh, uh, we are actually running yeah, we out of time. Running out of, of time, actually, we were supposed to have like a 60 minutes of conversation and we <laughs> on our 65th minute, I think. Uh, but I think we still have one last question. And this question is actually from our sponsor, uh, our friends from SmartCat. Uh, Vladimir, uh, the community manager of SmartCat, asks, how important is it to be well-versed with technology for aspiring translator? What do you guys think? Yes, yes uh, it's imperative that you learn to use uh, technology and your advantage. You have to know how to use uh, so many different tools. You have to educate yourself, read articles, read manuals, attend even webinars. And technology is a big part of this profession. You cannot do it without it. It's very important. It can help you. It can help you um, uh, with time. I mean, especially when you're yeah. translating in charges, for example, uh, it's not a time consuming sometimes. Uh, so you are able to deliver faster and take uh, more assignments. It's mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I agree. And I think it's especially important for those translators who are just starting out uh, because there's also an opinion in the translation now profession, opinion expressed by the more experienced translators that you can be successful even without using any CAD tools and things like that. But I think there, there is a certain, uh, uh, there are certain translators who can afford that. And uh, there are th certain fields where CAD tools, for example, or other technology are not that useful. Uh, for example, creative translation and, uh, translation and things like that. But on the other hand, there's uh, a lot of uh, fields where using technology and using CAD tools is, like Juan says, mandatory. And uh, I think that with time, there will be more and more of those areas of specialization. So, And uh, it's also for young translators, it can become uh, a kind of uh, their unique selling point and uh, something to differ to that can help them uh, differentiate themselves from other translators that they're especially tech savvy and uh, know a lot of di different are familiar with different uh, tools and things like that. Do you agree, Dmitri? Yeah, I absolutely agree. As a as an aspiring translator, you you you. You don't have to learn all, all the things you could, could possibly learn about technology, but at least you, you should educate yourself about what's out there. What are the current mm -hmm. developments? What uh, What is the future of our profession looks like? Because technology is a big part of uh, our profession, even though our profession is so creative in, 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 for many of us. Uh, technology is still here. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, here to help us. Sometimes it's here to destroy us. Uh, opinions uh, can vary on this one. Uh, and the jury is still out, as they say. Uh, but uh, I think technology is is important part of our profession, and you don't have to learn everything, but at least you you need to learn where everything is heading, what's the current developments, and what kind of tools are out there uh, for you, and what can they what can can they do for you? What's what's your benefit in using them? What's the benefit of using CAD tools, or uh, what's the benefit of using a uh, uh, dictation software, uh, or, or what's the benefit of machine translation, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to be uh, ahead of the competition, I think uh, technology uh, can really help you out uh, because it, when used correctly, it can help you speed up your translation process. It can uh, ease the burden on your uh, fingers or your wrists, especially when you're using dictation <laughs> software. Uh, so. Uh, you should definitely be on the lookout and try to uh, 
learn about technology. Can I say that because when you not when you do not use a uh, CAD tool, um, you automatically leave out um, a portion of uh, translation agencies that do work with certain CAD tools. That automatically means that you won't be able to provide services and you can't reach out to more agencies, to more clients. That means the cheapest exactly. money, right? Because uh, if two people apply to an agency and uh, the agency mentions on the website that um, that the use of a certain capital is mandatory, they're going to pick the person that knows how to use it. Yeah. So that means that you can't yeah. out and you lose you lose jobs, you lose money. You do. So I guess we get we get to round up. Do you have anything to add, Panas, to what you have said today? Probably some advice to someone who's just starting out. Yes, I would like that. Of course, there are so many topics that we didn't even touch upon, like yeah. rates yeah. Uh, and so many other things. But uh, the the main thing is that you have to love this profession. You have to do it professionally, not as a hobby, right? Um, be true to yourself. Uh, trust your gut. Uh, always try to educate yourself. Always. Mm -hmm. That never stops. Uh, appreciate feedback, negative and positive, especially negative. That will help you be better. Find someone that can help you when you start out and believe in yourself. It will take time, but it's going to worth it. Definitely. It's an amazing profession. Great points. I not to agree with you, Panos, on everything you just said. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who joined us today, tonight. Uh, thank you guys for all your questions. It's been a wonderful chat, a wonderful talk. Yeah. And yes, uh, if you want, if you want to see some other episodes, you can go to our website, which is at translatorlonet.com and subscribe to our mailing list so that you get access to all the previous episodes of season one and uh, also we'll send you notifications of the upcoming episodes and roundups of some episodes that you wasn't you, that you weren't able to watch live also don't f forget to check out uh the website of our sponsors smart hat uh, you can either click the green button under this video or just go to smartcat.ai, uh, right, Vladimir? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, guys. Have a Thank wonderful you, day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.